Good morning, everyone. All right, well, it looks like some people have started joining. Um, like Lindsay said, welcome um, to week one of our Crop Hour webinar series. Um, this week, we will be covering and focusing on a variety of corn topics. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Shelby Pritchard, and I'm currently the Integrated Pest Management Specialist here at SDSU, and I will be the moderator for the webinar series this year as well. And I appreciate you taking the time out of your morning to be here with us. Just a few quick things to mention. Um, down at the bottom of the Zoom bar, there is a Q&A feature. Feel free to ask questions throughout the talks today, and we will do our best job to answer them for you. Um, a few other things, there will be a poll launched after a, both of our talks today. So if you could please fill that out, that would be wonderful. And then I know a bunch of you are curious and need to get your CCA credits. So you will also be able to obtain those after each talk and we'll make sure we leave those up on the screen for you. Um, and since it's already a little after 10, um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first speaker of the day. Um, it's Dr. Adam Varenhorst. He obtained his master's in entomology in 2011 and then his PhD in entomology in 2015. Um, both of these degrees were obtained at Iowa State University, and then from 2015 until now, he's been at South Dakota State University as the Extension Entomology Specialist. And with that, he will be talking about corn insect issues faced in 2021. So take it away, Adam. All right. Thanks, Shelby. And thanks, everyone, for attending today. So, uh, you know, as we think, think ahead, we have to think back first. And so I, I always like to kind of revisit what were the issues that we really faced during 2021. And today we're talking about corn. So let's dive into it a little bit. And one of the first insects we're going to talk about, and this wasn't just for corn, but kind of all of our crops uh, that we faced in 2021 were grasshoppers. And you know, grasshoppers in South Dakota can kind of be a hot topic. And so it's not a big surprise for us when we do see outbreaks, but it is kind of nice to keep track of those outbreaks and understand what's it going to look like for the next year. And so in several areas of South Dakota last year, there were grasshopper outbreaks and we had that same situation in 2020. So looking ahead to 2022, well, we keep moving in that direction of having some issues we're probably going to see some grasshopper issues in 2022. But maybe there's some factors we can look at to kind of help predict it, and there are. And so one of the things we can look at is what our falls look like. So falls that have a longer period of time before our first hard frost, and we define that as anytime the temperature drops below 28 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a hard frost. Uh, that's going to reduce the grasshopper populations. Now, it won't kill all of them at one time, but it will reduce them. And so 2020 had a nice fall. We had good grasshopper populations in 2021, likely because of that. They can lay their eggs longer in the fall, and that leads to larger populations. Now, 2021 was pretty dry, and that can also lead to grasshopper population increases. And uh, I want to kind of go back, so we're actually going back to 2020 first, and this is near the Dakota Lakes Research Farm by Pier. And so this is one of our plots for uh, sunflowers. So I know wrong crop today, uh, but it really shows what can happen uh, with grasshoppers. And so the week before this picture was taken, these were great looking sunflowers, nice leaves on them, great heads developing. Uh, and we came back a week later and uh, my student goes, did it? We, did we have a hailstorm? Uh, because, you know, the beans around us looked really bad too. Uh, but what you can kind of see over here is there's some grass. And what actually happened was uh, the neighbors sprayed uh, for uh, knocking the grass out a little bit, and the grasshoppers moved from the grass into our sunflowers. And that was an indication, though, of how bad the grasshoppers were, because as soon as the food that they were on, the grass was gone. They moved in for whatever else they could find. Happened to be our sunflowers first. They did wipe out a lot of these soybeans before they got managed. But uh, in a week, grasshoppers can completely defoliate fields if populations are large enough. And to give you an idea, this is what the heads look like. So we, we ended up just scratching this project. But, you know, normally we think of 
the thresholds for these is eight to 15 adults per square yard. And, uh, just right here, we have eight adults on a head. And so a week later, the heads were gone too. They pretty much just ate everything they could. And so grasshoppers are something to keep track of. And I mentioned 2021 was pretty dry and it was dry pretty much throughout this season. It kind of varied on where the extreme drought, which is in red was, but even we had down to abnormally dry, we pretty much had every level of drought except for exceptional in South Dakota last year. And as the season progressed, as I mentioned, it kind of moved around where the really dry areas were, but for the most part, it was dry throughout the state. And it was dry even into September. And in some areas in the fall, we did get some moisture, but it was dry even then. And uh, now we're seeing that we're not getting a lot of snowfall. So, uh, you know, things are looking like it's going to be a little bit drier, at least from the insect perspective. Well, what's that mean for a lot of these insects? Well, for grasshoppers, it means that there are lots of uh, dry areas, patches of dirt, and they actually use those for egg laying. So the more bare dirt you have, the more advantage they're going to have for laying eggs. And so also they like drier springs. And the reason for that, they're emerging from the soil. They, the eggs are in the soil, they're emerging. If it's really wet, that can increase the risk of drowning for them and actually reduce the populations a little bit. So a drier springs actually also better for these grasshoppers. And if we look at for South Dakota here, our first hard frost, so 28 degree freeze, we were a little behind schedule in a lot of the state. This lighter green represents late October. And uh, there were some areas that even went into November before we had that first uh, real cold freeze. There were some areas that were a little bit earlier. So this is the end of September. But overall, we were pretty late uh, in terms of what we would normally expect. And uh, What's that mean? Well, if we're about three to four weeks late on our first hard frost, that means that the grasshoppers had about three or four more weeks to lay eggs. And so between the drought, the later frost, we're probably going to see large grasshopper populations in 2022. The populations have been building and they're probably going to continue to build. A lot will depend on these spring conditions. So the 2022 spring conditions may really set the the stage for what to expect for a lot of insects, uh, but especially for grasshoppers. And so the threshold for these is eight to 14 adults per square yard. And that's kind of the, our general threshold. Uh, that's not just for corn, it kind of covers everything in 30 to 45 nips per square yard. And when I say that is we just go out, we stand and we estimate what a square yard is, and then we watch the grasshoppers move with it. So it's not a perfect science, but it can get us pretty, pretty good idea of what's going on in that area. We do recommend treating when the grasshoppers are young. So when they're in those smaller stages, because it's easier to kill them at that point in time. When they get to the larger stages of being nymphs or when they reach adulthood, uh, they do take a little bit more insecticide to knock the populations down. Another issue with grasshoppers and a few other insects is they will also sometimes show up right around pollination and corn. And if they clip the silks, that can lead to reduce ear fill and in uh, the end of the season, reduce yield. And so if silks are clipped and not just from in, uh, grasshoppers, any insect within a half an inch of the tip of the husk, that's when it's time to spray. Or if you have pollination that's uh, less than 50% complete, you really want to make sure that you're watching those silks and seeing if they're getting clipped. Another insect we've been seeing more in South Dakota. So since I've started, uh, this has shown up several years and it's the redheaded flea beetles. And uh, they'll show up in corn, soybean. Typically they're doing a little bit of defoliation, but in corn, if they're feeding on those silks, which we've seen them do, uh, they can cause some pretty quick reduction in the amount of silks available, and that can lead to issues, as I mentioned, down the road. So these typically show up sometime in July, kind of varies with the year. They get their name because their head is, it's almost a dark brown, but it's kind of a dark red color, so red-headed flea beetle. Uh, sometimes I'm asked if these are uh, corn rootworms, a different species, but they aren't. Uh, they do look pretty similar, however, uh, in the similar in size. These are going to have a black body and you can't see it great in this picture, uh, but you'd kind of notice the legs are tucked under and that's where they get that name flea beetle because these can actually jump pretty long distances. And so uh, these modified back legs essentially are springboards and they can kind of propel themselves, especially if you disturb the plant away from whatever's disturbing them. 
And so I mentioned they're defoliators. And so if you have a large population, you might start to notice your leaves having these small holes or uh, small areas of tissue removed. And so that's a flea beetle right there. And you can see this defoliation they're causing. So that doesn't cause yield loss in itself, uh, but it's when we start to see them. And you can see these silks here that have been clipped. So you'll see that little bit of scarring uh, where they were fed on. And this guy right here, this red-headed flea beetle is actively feeding on them. So it's a half inch. Imagine that that tips about right there, uh, somewhere right in there. So you, you wanna make sure you're not getting clipped within a half inch of the tip of the husk. So the threshold for these guys is five beetles or more per ear. Uh, so that's if you're noticing huge populations before the silk clipping starts, you can get ahead of it. If you're watching again, same threshold is for the grasshoppers. So pollination less than 50% complete with quite a few beetles present or silks being clipped to within a half inch of the tip of the husk. And so there are other insects, including corn rootworms that will feed on the silks. And it's just something we really need to monitor during that time of the season, because we wanna to try to optimize that yield and we don't want the insects feeding on the silks to be the reduction. So that leads us into our next pest though, uh, two species that we really watch for here in South Dakota. And we have them every year. So it's kind of one of those, we talk about this every time we talk about insects and corn, but they're the corn rootworms. So we have the Northern corn rootworms, which are uh, depicted here. So there'll be a small beetle that's green. When they first emerge in the summer, they can be kind of a yellow color. That's because they haven't fed on any leaf tissue yet. Once they feed on leaves, they start to turn this nice green color. We really worry about the larvae for both species because they're feeding on the roots of the corn and we can't really do a lot about that once the corn's in the ground. Both species though, the adults can cause some issues, uh, especially during pollination. If there's a large population present, they'll feed on the silks. The other species is the Western corn rootworm, which are these yellow beetles here. And they'll have these black lines on their abdomens. So you can see here, there can be some variation uh, of those black lines, but uh, if you see them in the cornfield and you see these lines, pretty good guess that they're corn rootworms. So the life cycle for these guys is very similar between the two species. And so right now, uh, the life stage is eggs. So there's eggs in the soil right now. They laid the eggs in the fall. And so when we look, a, look ahead into the 2022 season, they're going to remain eggs until it warms up. And then sometime in early June, we'll start to have egg hatch and then the larvae will be in the soil. So pretty much from when corn's planted, uh, it has a few weeks and then the larvae will start hatching and then they're going to be active until sometime in July, uh, some places, depending on soil temperatures, maybe into August. But as soon as the life cycle is complete, we'll start to see those adults emerge and then they'll be in the fields. And a lot of times, as we know, they spread out a little bit from the fields but they're going to be some, some period in there. And you'll notice there's a lot of overlap here. And that's just because there's, it's not a perfect system and soil temperature can really affect this. But it, mainly the point is, is that we can't really do a lot for management because this is all in the soil unless we put traits or insecticides into the soil around to protect the corn. So there's two different methods we can do to scout for corn rootworms. And if you notice, it's in July and August in both cases, uh, because we're actually looking at what happened. So our best way to know if we have an issue is to look at the roots to see if we're having feeding occur in that field. And uh, the, what we do is we dig corn roots and then we wash them because we need to remove the soil to see the uh, root tissue. And we're examining root nodes four, five, and six. So your brace nodes, if you imagine if you're holding the stock, you have your brace nodes and then node six is right below those and then five and four. And so uh, it kind of goes in reverse order for what you might think. Uh, so here's the brace. So uh, here would be six, five, four. So you can imagine, and I like this picture a lot it's from Marlon Rice when he was at Iowa State. It shows a health, pretty healthy root system for a corn plant. And then this is one where the rootworms got a hold of it and there's hardly anything left. So you can, if you could choose between the two, you always want to go with the one that has a lot of root tissue because you have more soil, uh, soil contact. So you're going to have increased water and nutrient uptake. And also you're going to have more structural support. 
one of the things we have with rootworms is a lot of lodging because as the root tissue is removed, there's nothing to hold that plant into the soil. And so we have this node injury scale that goes from zero to three. And so if you're at a zero, there's no apparent feeding or it's very limited. So you might see a little bit of scarring, but it's not really bad. If you're at a one to a 1.5, you have at least one full node, an average of one full node destroyed to within one and a half inches of the stock. So it doesn't have to be all the way fed to the stock. It's with one and a half inches of it. And if you have that, you're already looking, excuse me, I went the wrong way, at about a 15% yield loss. That's the rating of one is about 15% yield loss. So that's already pretty significant in terms of what we don't want to see. Now, I don't put two because we can all do math. And when we get to a rating of three, we're looking at 45% yield loss. So the rating of two is 30. So it just incrementally increases by 15%. If you get to a rating of three, you have two or more nodes gone. And this is the picture that we use here. Uh, so there's nothing there. And that's a rating of three. So significant yield loss. You're going to notice you might not even be able to harvest the field because it's going to lodge pretty bad. The rating of a one to 1.9, so right before you hit the two, you'll notice there's going to be a lot of scarring. So that discoloration is from where those larvae were feeding. They might not have clipped the root all the way back, but they're going to cause scarring to be present. So that's why it's important to wash that soil off. We really need to see what that root tissue looks like. It should be nice, uh, light white, uh, kind of clear almost on those really small ones. But anywhere you see the brown discoloration, that means that those roots were fed on. Now, the second scouting method is a lot less time intensive. It doesn't require digging, digging numerous uh, roots out of the field and then washing them. So typically, this is the option people prefer because it just doesn't take as long and it doesn't require as much effort. Uh, and so what you do is you purchase these yellow sticky cards online. And I say they're sticky. They have a glue substance you don't want to get on your hands because once you do you're going to get it on the steering wheel. Everything you touch will have that on. It's, it remains sticky for a very long time. And so we typically recommend wearing nitrile gloves uh, just so you don't get it all over everything. You can take those off and throw them away. But you put these out, they're about $1.59 a piece. I noticed uh, just like everything right now, I looked this up before today's talk. A lot of places say they're out of stock. I'm guessing that has to do with our supply chain issues that we're still facing. Uh, but if you can get a hold of them, they should be about $1.59, maybe a little bit more now uh, per card. You replace them weekly. So you go out to the field, you tie them to a corn stock, make sure you have your phone or something that you can record a GPS coordinate so you can kind of follow it back to get back to where it is in the field if you put a lot of these out. Uh, a lot of times we hear from these stories where people put them out, they cut, find them back, then they see them at harvest. Uh, so you want to make sure you have some way of making sure you can get back to them but you replace them on a weekly basis. And when you remove them from the field, you put the new one on, you look at that one you removed and you count the total number of corn rootworm adults on each card. So this also makes it easy because you're not worrying about, do I have Northern and Western, how many of each? It's just any rootworm adults. And the threshold is two adults per card. And if you hit that, you know that you need to do something different the next time you're planting corn into that field or maybe in the neighboring field, if you have fields right around there too. And so that's also what we do with that root digging. If we hit those higher ratings, we have to figure out what we're going to do the next time the corn's planted. And the reason for that is this is what we don't want to get to. We don't want to have corn that's completely lodged. And a lot of times when you don't have that water nutrient uptake, we also don't get very nice ears. So it's just reduced yields all around if you can even harvest it. And so I mentioned this numerous times, we're scouting for the next year's management. So we don't really have rescue treatments for larval feeding. We can't do anything once the seed's in the ground. So the best bet is to make sure what we're doing with the seed before it goes in the ground is going to give us our best bet for protection. And I mentioned we don't worry about the adults too much, but corn rootworm adults in very large populations can also be silk feeders. And so if you have a large population present, they can be managed using foliar insecticides. Uh, this used to be called beetle bombing because when populations were huge, a lot of times you just spray even before the silks were being clipped to try to reduce the field population a little bit. But you want to keep those populations kind of as low as possible. But uh, typically we don't see a lot of foliar insecticides applied for corn rootworms anymore just because we don't see this in every field that we go to. 
one of the things for corn root or management that's kind of important to think about is there's some things that we don't want to use. So we say about we need to make sure we have this plan for managing these pests, but uh, based on some issues in neighboring states and uh, some of the populations were detected in South Dakota uh, by neighboring researchers in neighboring states. Uh, but we want to avoid single gene BT products for corn rootworm. The reason for that is we want to try to keep what we have working as long as possible. And so single genes are just probably not going to cut it anymore. We need to make sure we have two genes that work, put those in the field together and try to make that last as long as possible. We want to avoid pyramids containing these traits. The reason for that is there have been failures detected either in neighboring states or populations tested from South Dakota. And so it's CRY3 BB1, and I apologize, I don't have the trade names for these, CRY3435 AB1 or ECRY3.1 AB. Uh, so because of those field failures, we recommend just kind of staying away from those. And we also want to make sure that we're not using a pyramid that contains a trait that isn't on this list with one of these, because then we're really, we're paying money for something that probably isn't going to work. So you want to make sure your traits that you're selecting aren't listed so that you're getting the most bang for your buck there. Something else we don't recommend doing is applying soil insecticides with the BT traits. And the reason for that is in the past, there were issues with resistance to some of these products detected. This was years ago. Uh, there's issues now with the BT. The best bet is to pick one, see if it works. And if it doesn't, you know, to switch to something else. If it does work, we still recommend the next year probably switching. So if you use a BT one year, next year, it won't be a terrible idea to not do the BT, use soil applied insecticides. If you're doing corn on corn, the reason for that is that keeps mixing it up and those beetles have a harder time developing resistance to what uh, management strategies you're using. So, uh, but if you are going to go with the BT, go with, go with a program that doesn't include these and if possible, even rotate those BT products on a year to year basis. So the next pest we're going to talk about uh, with the exception of the European corn borer can be kind of minor, sporadic throughout the state. We have just a few minutes left, but the European corn borer, for some of the people uh, listening today, maybe you remember when this was such a big issue uh, in the Midwest. Uh, and then we went through a long period of time where we didn't hear a lot of, from uh, researchers about European corn borers. And that was because we had BT products and BT products work great. And at least in South Dakota, they're still working great. Most of the Midwest, I have heard that there are some issues uh, in the, on the East coast with some of the a population of European corn borer there with the BT, but so far we're not seeing issues. And so the beetles are what, uh, sorry, the caterpillars here are what cause all the issues. So this is a European corn borer caterpillar. The moths, if you remember back when these were a huge issue, if you were driving down the road in the evening, uh, your windshield would be covered pretty quickly if you were next to a cornfield. Uh, but the moths are relatively small. They vary a little bit in color between the male and female. Uh, typically they have their wings though, kind of makes a triangle shape. And a lot of times if you have a yard light, they'll be on the side of the house or up in the yard light if you have a large population present. So the caterpillars have a dark brown head, kind of a light tan body with these dark spots, but we won't see the caterpillars very much unless you're splitting stalks. So when they first emerge, they're really small. When they hatch, uh, really small little guys on the leaves. When they hatch, they can't really feed through the leaf. So a lot of times they'll start feeding and they strip layers off the leaf and we get this window pane injury. So that's what this looks like. That's the window pane injury. And then after they feed on the leaves a little bit, they're always moving towards the top of the plant. They're heading towards the whorl. When they feed on the leaves in the whorl, once those uncurl, we get this nice line of holes. And because they're kind of the size of BBs, we call this shot hole injury but it's going to be a perfectly straight line because they fed one spot. And then when that uncurls, you get this nice line of holes. So that's another indicator that you might have these out in the field. And the larvae will feed on the leaves first, but as I mentioned, they're heading up to the whorl and then they're going to head down into the stalk. And in some cases they even make it into the shank and into the ears. And so you can imagine that can cause some issues. So for the European corn borer, one of the first things we do is we try to use degree days. So we, uh, in some cases, we just use uh, a fixed degree day point at which point 
uh, once we reach that level, we start accumulating degree days. We still try to do capture the first spring moth and then start. That's a good indicator they're active. Uh, it's a little bit trickier. We have to use black light traps for that. And obviously, if you don't have a ton of those out, it's going to be hard to detect them throughout the state. But then you start accumulating degree days. Their threshold is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can imagine South Dakota, sometimes it takes a little while in the spring before we hit that. But when we do, things start happening pretty fast. And here's a table just to kind of give you an idea. So at 212 degree days after the first moth is captured is when we expect hatch to occur. And then they have feeding. And in South Dakota, it's possible to have two generations of the European corn borer. As you move north, though, there's one generation. The second generation obviously just takes more degree days uh, after the, those eggs are laid before we start seeing them being active, but these will be the stock bores. And so the best thing to do if you think you have an issue, and most issues are going to be in conventional corn, is examine 100 plants, so five sets of 20 throughout the field. You record any whirl feeding that you see. If you see the shot hole or the window painting, you record that as well, and you target that plant and you dissect it. So you dissect that, and then maybe one that you don't see nearby, but you go through and you count the number of larvae present. Uh, and then you also try to determine how big they are, because that's going to be a factor in whether or not uh, you can manage them effectively. But we're not going to go through this all the way, but kind of shows all the math that goes into determining if your field needs to be treated. And even if we can manage these, uh, the best thing we can bet if we're using insecticides is that we'll get about 80% management. So one of the things we recommend is if you're planting conventional corn, don't be the first or last field planted in your neighborhood. Try not to be the target field uh, when those moths are trying to find corn to lay eggs on. If you have an infested field, harvesting early might be beneficial for you so you don't have lodging issues that prevent harvest. And another thing is, is, if you might have an infested field, don't do fall tillage. Leaving those stalks up in the air uh, does increase the risk for those to freeze uh, because they kind of rely on getting incorporated down into the soil. And so if we leave them up in the air, there's a higher risk for them to get frozen. And so if you are treating with foliar insecticides, you have to do it pretty quickly after detection because once they go in the stalk, we can't really do anything. So another pest we'll just touch on is the common stock board. These caterpillars aren't normally seen, but they kind of have a purple saddle, an orange head with a black stripe. And the reason I say we don't normally see them is they'll be down in the whirl. So if you are on the edges of your field and you notice routinely that you lose plants on the edge, it might be due to common stock board. Younger corn's more susceptible. They're only an issue on field borders or field along anything you might have. So if you have terraces, waterways, they can show up there because they come out of grasses and weeds in the spring. But you only want to uh, look at the border rows when you're scouting. They're really an issue in May to June. So if you see a little bit of feeding or what looks like sawdust, you start, pull the whirl out, start uncurling it. And if they're in there, you kind of find this little guy here. And just so you have a minute left, Adam. Just thanks, energetic. Shelby. Yep. Uh, one of the things I like to point out is that we don't, we have thresholds for these, but most of the time we don't hit them. But if you do notice an issue, one of the nice things about this pest is you only have to manage the first four to six rows. One of the best things we can do for the common stock bore is not to manage weeds around our field prior to corn emergence, because that's going to increase the likelihood of them moving into the field. Last pest is black cutworm. This is what that looks like in the field. We manage these if you have 5% of seedlings cut or have leaf feeding. We have seen this last couple of years. They're more of an issue if we have a wet spring or if you have some weeds. So after 2019, we had some black cutworm issues because although we had a lot of those prevent plant acres, so there were some more weeds in those fields. And so we had cutworm issues after that. So best thing to do if you're worried about cutworms is use Cry1F uh, BT corn hybrids. You can use foliar insecticides, but it's best to apply them late in the day because they're under the soil during the day. And hopefully I didn't go over, here's some information for everyone. And if you need to get a hold of me ever, here's my contact information. You can reach me at my office number. Uh, you can also email me. I'm not always on it, but I do have a Twitter. So if you have Twitter and want to reach out to me on there, feel free to. Otherwise, Shelby, I'll turn it back over to you. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Adam. And um, I know that we will have a poll that needs to be launched, just a couple of questions that we would like everyone to answer. Um, we'll leave that up for about a minute. And while that's up, I believe there might be one question for you, Adam, down below. Yes, I see that from David. And, uh, you know, I, I don't put that together, but I understand what you're saying and uh, showing above moisture. And I think maybe one of those things is, you know, probably, unfortunately, we probably have different groups looking at those two different things if we're thinking about drought and then also flooding. Uh, but I don't know, you know, the perception is, is I think if, if you're in a really dry area, my, what, what I've heard in the last couple of years is I think a lot of times people think the drought might be worse than what it's reported as. And so I, I think that those terms are kind of used to give us an idea of how bad things are, but it is kind of hard to really understand that when you're looking at the figure and maybe you're in an area where you haven't had any rain and it's listed as moderate or severe, and then an area where you think it's maybe not as bad is listed as extreme. And some of that just also has to do with where the rain gauges are that they're looking at. And so uh, if you have more questions about that, I recommend reaching out to Laura Edwards, our state climatologist, and she'd be able to give you a lot better answer probably than what I just did. But thanks. One second, I'm trying to share the CCA credit. see. All right, that's been two minutes. Do you want me to close the poll? We've got 63% responses. Yep, you can go ahead and close the poll. And then I am actually struggling to share the screen. Adam, do you have the CCA credit document? For some reason it's not allowing me. There you go, Shelby. Thank you so much. So we'll leave that up for everyone for a second. And then while this is up, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce our second speaker of the day. Um, it'll be Connie Strunk. Um, her talk will be the review of corn diseases in South Dakota. Um, Connie got her master's in plant pathology at South Dakota State University in 2005. And from 2005 to 2011, she was an agronomy extension educator in Parker, South Dakota. And since 2011 until now, she's an extension field specialist in plant pathology. And with that, I believe we've had enough time and we can turn it over to you, Connie. All right, just kind of getting things loaded up here. Well, thank you, Shelby, for that introduction. I'm just gonna briefly talk about some of the corn diseases that we get in South Dakota and some that we saw last year with it being hot and dry last year early on we didn't get as many diseases as we have seen in years past that are more of the needing the moisture and the moisture to make that disease happen but with that the first disease that we did see quite a bit of was a bacterial disease called bacterial leaf streak of corn. It's relatively new uh, within the Midwest and within South Dakota. It was first reported in Nebraska in 2016, and it was identified here in South Dakota in 2018. Since then, we've had some other states kind of join the list of 
found it, if you will. We've had Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Kansas, Minnesota, Oklahoma, and Texas with this bacterial disease, as you'll see, I mean, it can start off pretty small and that progression starts to really encompass that leaf area. It is caused by xanthomonas, So it is a bacteria that overwinters in infested crop debris. And what you'll learn is that this bacteria, it needs, it enters the corn leaves through the natural openings on the plant or through a wound. So like the wound could occur, whether it's from hail, sandblasting, you know, wind, any of that, that might've weakened or caused a little bit of a wound or a weaker spot within that plant to allow that bacteria to enter in. It is favored by higher humidity. And then if you're in a continuous corn or a minimum tillage practice, mainly because it is, you know, it overwinters in that crop debris. So it's still there waiting for the, that perfect opportunity. So if we have moisture or, you know, humidity, it causes the, allows that bacteria to enter within those openings or wounds on that plant. And that's how a lot of our bacterial diseases work here in the state of South Dakota and just in nature. We, since it's a bacterial disease, it is not, um, fungicides are not effective at controlling it. What this disease looks like is it starts out as kind of a narrow, long, light brown streak on the corn plant as over time, it'll start to go outside or over encompass starts to expand, starts to enlarge in where it becomes long brown streaks where it'll have wavy margins. And that is a big key here. They're not always easy to see with the naked eye, but it goes outside. They're not constrained within the leaf veins of the plant. Um, as we're looking at Bacterial leaf streak here on corn. If you look way to the left, this is a, a lighter, just starting out infection. So notice they're not nearly as long, still fairly contained within the veins, but just starting to expand the middle. You start to see more of that disease take hold. They're starting to get longer. They're starting to go across the veins where then they could end up on the right the picture on the right of the screen here, where they really become long and go across the leaf vein in size. So it chews up quite an area on the corn leaves with the bacterial leaf streak. You know, a good rule of thumb is if you're able to hold that corn leaf and put it up into the light, you'll start to see some of those yellow streaking happen within the plant. You know, the good news is this disease does not appear to be systemic. It is, or cause plant death. It's more kind of locally in, in essence, there's no magic cure because it is a bacterial disease. Fungicides are not effective at controlling that disease. So again, some management for bacterial leaf streak the impact really depend on yield really depends on the extent and time of infection. So when did it move in? Was it early in the growing season? Or did it come in later? And then how, you know, what does it look? Is it still pretty light or does, is it really covering up those leaves? Other opportunities to help manage this disease would be crop rotation. Really caution because this disease, since it resides in the, in the corn debris, right? The residues, if you have a lot of volunteer corn, or again, if you're in that continuous operation, that disease is still there. So we want to kind of manage the rotation. If you're able to do tillage to kind of manage or break down some of those residues, that will help, but that's not every system is set up for tillage. So that's only if it's practical for you, some of the things that you could do to help reduce some of the inoculum load out there is if you're able to bail up the stocks to reduce that corn residue for fields that have been positive for this disease. Right now, there's no resistance in the hybrids or inbreds. So just be cautious of that. I'm hoping over time we'll start to see that since we do have resistance for gosses wilt. So we did see a lot of bacterial leaf streak last year here in the state of South Dakota. Prior to that, 
in other years, we used to see a lot of the gases wilt and bacterial blight. We didn't always see both phases of the disease. This is another bacterial disease, just like the name says. It is also born on the corn, soil borne, and it's on corn residue. The big difference with this disease is the resistance is the main defense. Again, because it's a bacterial disease, fungicides are not, at, are not effective at controlling this disease. Gases wilt has been known to cause quite a bit of yield loss. So if you do get this disease out in the field, we want to make sure we properly ID it so you're aware of it to make that seed selection for the next growing season. Because again, fungicides are not effective. What this disease looks like is you're going to kind of see the tan lesion. Generally, it's on the edges of the leaf, but not, <clears throat> not all the time. But it'll be generally on that leaf edge. It's brown or tan color. And it can start small, and then it just starts to take across the going across the leaf of the veins, kind of growing with the edge of the corn plant. But the big diagnostic here for Goss's wilt are the little freckles. They're kind of olive green to kind of a black within the center of that lesion. And oftentimes you'll see the bacterial exudate kind of dry within or on that plant or the water soaking appearance that are pretty phenomenal with our bacterial diseases, especially with this one. If you're able to cut the leaf and you can put it in some water, sometimes you'll start to see that bacterial just stream out of the corn plant and into the water. So again, um, another look at the Goss's bacterial wilt and blight here. It's a two-part phase disease. Right now we're looking at the blight aspect. So again, that long tan lesion. And then you'll see some of those freckles or kind of the freckled colored appearance. So that's the the blight phase, the wilt phase is if we you start to see some rot or the plant uh, starting to look real droughty, stunted, or even toppling over. A lot of times if you were to take that stalk, cut it off, you'd start to see the bacteria clogging up the tubes, the conducting tubes within the stem of the plant. And so it chokes off some of the nutrients. So again, it's a two-part disease. We don't always see the wilt part. But if we get infection pretty early in the growing season, then we can see both phases here in the state. So just be mindful of that. And this is looking at Gus's wilt on the left versus our bacterial leaf streak on the right. We do know that yield loss can be fairly significant with gases. And we're still learning more about bacterial leaf streak. So if you've worked with bacterial leaf streak or have had those it properly identified and you've had some issues, please share that with me, with us, so we can kind of get a little bit better handle of how this disease is working here in the state. One of the other things that we saw quite a bit throughout different fields this past year were some ear rots. I don't have all of the ear rots pictured here, but depending, you know, we saw some gibberella, we had some fusarium, we had a little bit of aspergillus, just have had some different, different ear rots, tended to need some damage to those kernels, to the corn, which could be caused, you know, from hail, winds, or in the case of aspergillus and our fus fusarium, the hot and dry weather, we saw a lot of those out in the field. And our big concern was that they contain mycotoxins. So you want to be wary of that. You know, a lot of times we can't go with color alone because some, you know, is it white? Is it pinkish? If it gives a textbook colors, then it's pretty easy to tell. But not all the time do our diseases work like that. A lot of times they're going to start at the tip and move, move down. Some of them can be kind of scattered. So we do have different tests um, that we can do for it, but a, a general rule of thumb, you know, gibberella starts at the top. So it kind of starts at the tip of the plant or the corn cob and works its way down. Diplodia typically starts at the bottom of the corn cob and works its way up. Fusarium 
can be at the tip, but it's generally random throughout the corn cob. Um, again, with our ear rots, it's usually some injury to kernels and then high relative humidity. So we might have high heat out there, but if it's been humid, we tend to see a lot of our ear rots develop. And so then there's, when it goes to combining, you know, checking for stock rots, checking for the ear rots, you know, we want to associate with them. So we're able to be on the lookout for that. With gibberella, that one has a, Z, a Dawn or the Z, Z Air Leon. Can't speak this morning. Anyhow, you know, just want to really be cautious with the ear rots, get them tested, especially if we're going to be feeding to livestock. We can speak more on that, but due to time, I need to keep moving here. Some of the other diseases that we'll see throughout the state. Now we didn't see a whole lot of these diseases. You know, they are other than our rust, they are residue borne diseases. So they are here and within our environment, our climate, again, crop rotation helps break that down tillage if practical. We've got Northern corn leaf blight, which has like a tan lesion can look very similar to Goss's wilt. So it's usually they can get easily misidentified because it starts as tan, can be on the edge. You know, they start kind of smaller if there is some resistance to the, to the hybrids or inbreds. If, they, if there's some susceptibility, they can get quite large in size. There can be multiple lesions on a leaf for northern corn leaf blight, but they can go anywhere from an inch up to seven inches in length. They can be you know, side by side, or they can be scattered within that leaf. So it can cause some death there. So it's one that we can manage with fungicide. If conditions are right for it, meaning we need some moisture to make disease happen. If it's been dry and it's not humid, the opportunity for disease to take hold just isn't there in the grand scheme of the disease triangle mind frame, if you will. So that's a disease to think about. Um, again, it's kind of that cigar shaped, could have a dirty center. So that's how we really want to look at those freckles and water soaking appearance that Goss's wilt has, because we tend to get confused between northern corn leaf blight and Goss's wilt. Another fungal disease is gray leaf spot, that this one can be quite if conditions are prevalent and we get infection early and there's susceptibility out there, we can have some yield loss. Again, if we're under an irrigation plan or continuous corn operation, that's where we really benefit for some of these fungicides. Um, again, if it's dry and it's not humid or having some of that extra little moisture, we tend to not see much of the disease but gray leaf spot starts off as really small. Generally, we kind of miss the early diagnosis part. It's kind of like a little tiny pinprick size followed by a little tan necrotic area that will turn into a rectangular type lesion. The shape of this one's important with the rectangular lesion generally is bound within the veins of the leaf. Again, it is a fungal disease that we can control with our fungicide, our rust. We have to realize that they blow in, and we'll talk more about the rust here in a minute. And then eye spot, again, starts small, kind of necrotic, or a halo, as we would call it, for help identify. We like warmer weather. And um, moisture key, again, with common rust, generally we see this disease in every cornfield in South Dakota. This year was a little bit of an exception just because we weren't wet early on. So it was drier, so we didn't see as much common rust out there. But again, if you have common rust, those pustules appear on both the upper and lower leaf surfaces. They're typically brown to brownish red, elongated in shape, scattered on the, on the leaf surface. Common rust prefers that cooler temps, and then we need some moisture for that disease to take hold. Southern rust, this is a rust that we have to worry about if it would move in early enough. 
And we talk about early enough, meaning if we find this disease where, when it typically blows in, it's around that black layer, late August, September, black layer. We don't see much of a yield loss, if anything at all. Now, if we had late planted corn or a thing, if it moved in or blew in earlier in the season, then we could be setting ourselves up for needing fungicide to control this disease because it can be quite yield devastating with southern rust. The pustules appear primarily on the upper leaf surface. They're orange to light brown. They're kind of round in shape. They're generally densely packed on the leaf surface or pretty clustered together. Southern rust likes it warm for infection to take hold with that moisture or humidity. So this is kind of looking at southern rust on the bottom leaf versus common rust on the top. Again, common is pretty common and we generally don't need a fungicide here in South Dakota because our weather pattern changes a bit and it kind of puts the disease at hold. Um, southern rust, that is the one we do have to worry about for yield loss. Again, this is just looking at northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot, with those rectangular lesions and then shape, we could use a fungicide for. Where all these diseases and the kind of the big take home that I really want to bring forth is getting things properly ID'd. You know, we have a we don't have a lot of different diseases in corn, but the ones that we do have, generally there's a look-alike for something else. So we've got northern corn leaf blight and gosses wilt the look alike. We've got gray leaf spot, which is on the left versus bacterial leaf streak on the right. Big difference is gray leaf spot. Again, the rectangular, usually contained within the vein and pretty sharp edges, where with bacterial leaf streak, they'll go across the veins. We have what we call a wavy edge. So kind of be watching for that. If in doubt, you know, send, it, send pictures into myself or the other agronomist send in samples to help get it properly ID'd because we, want, we don't want to be putting on a fungicide unless we absolutely need to, because we're going to be developing some resistance otherwise. Physoderma leaf spot is a water mold. It starts out small. Um, they coalesce, kind of grow together, and then we'll start to see some dark color within the mid rib. One thing I just want to bring your attention to is a new disease in our region, but it's not in South Dakota yet. So I want to preference it's not in South Dakota yet. It is called tar spot. If you're familiar with the black spot that are on like a maple leaf, that's like a tar spot, same kind of color pattern. They're just not nearly as large, a little bit more smaller, a little bit raised, but often confused with the resting stages of our common rust. And they can be confused with physoderma leaf spot. So tar spot, you know, the impact on yield could be quite high. We're seeing about 30 bushels yield loss to an acre is what has been reported from the states that have been finding it. It is a fungal disease. It's been shown to survive on corn stubble. So again, you know, our rotation is gonna be key here and then tillage if able to help break that down. Um, tar spot is favored by warm temps, high humidity. It seems to be developing in corn later in the season, kind of mid to late grain fill. It's got a black tar-like appearance. You know, you're gonna think that something kind of spilled on there when you see it. These lesions may have a necrotic brown tissue around the lesion. Typically it has what's called a fisheye appearance. It can be found on the husks and leaves, you know, so it can be anywhere throughout the corn plants. Again, this is looking and kind of saying why we really need to have things properly identified. You know, looking at way to the left and A is the tar spot, looking at letter B here are the resting phases of common rust so they can be easily misidentified. And we really wanna make sure we can properly control the disease. You know, fungicide has been shown to be effective against tar spot. There's different um, fungicides out there, you know, looked at uh, susceptible versus uh, resistant lines. When we looked at the severity, you know, 
when we looked at the severity versus um, the disease versus the fungicide impact, we saw that there's three, four different fungicides that handle the disease pretty good. But since it's not a, a problem here in the state, we won't go into which ones we think might be best for us or anything like that. We're just seeing that there are some fungicides available there. Um, just to kind of wrap up when we manage and work with corn diseases, you know, hybrid selection is going to be huge, especially for our bacterial diseases, you know, managing our residue, especially in high disease environments. You may want to consider bailing off the stalks, tillage if it's practical, or if you're in that, um, have that opportunity to do so, um, rotating away, you know, if you could have more than two years to really help break down some of the diseases, that'd be great. But I know that our practices don't necessarily always allow it. If you do need to use a fungicide, we'd really recommend that VT to R1 stage of growth if disease is warranted. So just kind of know that field history, scout, keep notes of what disease you're seeing there, know what variety hybrid disease package you may have selected, you know, really follow that weather. So again, if it's dry and we're not having any moisture or humidity, our disease pressure tends to be low. If a fungicide is to be applied, you know, follow what the label says for the timing and mode of action and what mode of action you're using. Take note of that so we can rotate those. And then after you apply scout to note the eff efficacy or resistant issues that you may be seeing out there for disease. So with that, just want to share my contact information here. I'm located in the Sioux Falls Regional Extension Center. Again, you'd be able to, you know, email pictures or drop off samples, and I can certainly help the best we can there. And we do have the diagnostic clinic if it's something that needs more than a visual analysis. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Shelby. Okay. And I think you have a couple of questions in the chat, and I can read them off to you if you would like. Um, one from David Ortman is asking, is there any significant difference in corn disease or corn infestations between irrigation and dry land farming? Well, we see more disease pressure underneath the irrigation, mainly because we have that perfect home, perfect disease triangle, right? We have our corn, depending on what disease package you've selected, you just have some, some susceptibility there because we call it our susceptible host. We have the moisture with the irrigation to kind of set up that humidity and causing the moisture splash, depending on what um, rotation you're using. You know, even though, even if you're not corn on corn, if you're corn in something else, right? So you have some corn debris there. We have debris that's blowing in that you may not have had the disease, but the disease leaves can move into your field, if you will. When we have the irrigation, it kind of per has that perfect home where the rain, as things sporulate, if it, once we have rainfall or the humidity it causes the spores and pustules to shoot up into the corn crop to start that disease. So irrigation, you know, if, ma if managed is an okay thing to just be, be aware that you could have higher disease preference under irrigation. All right, and maybe just have time for one more question. Um, also from David Ortman was saying, my family has been farming in southeastern South Dakota longer than South Dakota has been a state. A half century ago, there was a variety of crop rotations. Now fields in our area are pretty much monoculture corn. How much of the corn infestations or corn diseases are due to this practice? Well, weather is always going to be a key player especially because a lot of our fungal diseases and bacterial diseases are residue born. So they overwinter on the corn residues. So again, even if your field is not a continuous corn operation, if we're corn beans, corn beans, or we rotate and corn is always the every other, we can still have residues laying out in the field. We can still have things blowing around. So, you know, the, the change to that, would have huge, but the key player is really the weather. You know, we're seeing it's been wetter earlier, wetter longer. And then with our rust, you know, as things blow up, 
you know, kind of always having to watch for them, you know, over time, I don't know if our rust will start to overwinter here, but right now we've been lucky enough where they blow up what we call that Puccinia pathway. And so we've not had to worry about rust taking hold early every year. You know, we're at the mercy of the winds and where we're finding this disease in the Southern states. All right, and I think we are right at 11. So um, I guess just a quick reminder that um, to look for an email from us at the end of the week, there will be a survey attached and we would really appreciate your evaluation of this week's presentation. Um, it just helps us plan for the next time. So thank yep. you, Connie. And just a reminder for everyone, if you're on today, we will have uh, presentations on corn topics Wednesday and Thursday as well. Uh, tomorrow will be topics covering corn hybrids, management and weed control. And Thursday we'll have topics on fertility updates, recommendations and fertility fertilizer prices. So if you're interested in these topics, please feel free to join us. Thanks.